All righty, folks. Welcome back to the Mushing Alaska podcast. As always, a pleasure to be here. A lot going on in our world lately. We've uh, we've attempted to do this intro a few times, but uh, Sean, how you doing, man? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. You know, I have had a fun week, uh, weekend, um, going and, uh, seeing the Ferrandi, which we've, we'll continue to talk about and, uh, excited for this weekend to come and super busy time for, for me personally and for you too, dude. And so, uh, but yeah, you know, it's busy, but it's, we're doing the things we want to do. And, uh, that's a pretty cool thing. So yeah, I'm doing all right. Right on, man. Well, um, you know, we'll kind of get to things. You know, I'm sure a lot of the listeners since our last episode, there's been some major news in the Iditarod community. And so we we were gonna do our best to kind of talk about it. Um, you know, during that time, the Iditarod board has voted to disqualify Eddie Burke Jr. and Brent Sass from the Iditarod for this year and that's due to violations of personal conduct um you know <laughs> it's like we've been trying to put this intro out for like four or five days and seriously like every day there's there's more and more developments that happen you know uh so following these decisions for the disqualification eddie's legal matters were dismissed which led to the board reinstating him for the race uh, and then I guess a few days ago, and then Eddie decided that he was going to opt to sit out this year's race, which is a whole nother thing that we can talk about as well. Um, one thing that we wanted to say is that we support the victims of domestic violence. We do not condone violence against women. And we would love to shift the focus from that ongoing narrative and developing situation that's been devastating news for those involved and for the mushing community uh at the end of the day we're just two brothers or two dudes with a mushing podcast trying to have a little fun and we feel that it would be inappropriate to everyone involved for us to delve any deeper into a sensitive situation that we are really not qualified to talk about so want to just go ahead and put that out there sean i don't know if there's something else that maybe you'd like to add to that as well. Yeah. I mean, there's just a lot of, uh, really alarming, you know, information that's coming out. Uh, and it's coming from a lot of different sources of, uh, some very credible sources and some not so much. I I'm friends with a lot of people in the mesh mushing community. You hear, you know, rumors and people, my friend told me this one time that this guy and da, 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 And so I just have like so much information bouncing around in my brain about this. And I have like opinions and I have like really strong emotions about this. And I, uh, we tried to kind of share them and I tried to, like we recorded this uh, like a a day ago and like, I tried to share my thoughts like off the dome and not, and, and with a little like less preparation, you know, than just kind of like we, we typically just kind of talk. You know, and so we, but like, as I was saying things, I was like, dude, I don't fucking know. Like, I don't even know, dude. And I'm, I'm just gonna like, know that it's really not my place to talk about this situation that, you know, and I, I just feel like my, the information that I'm getting is from all over the place. And, and, uh, and it's just not appropriate for me to be commenting on, on this. And, uh, it's really been a, um, yeah, a pretty big explosion, uh, in the mushroom community and really tough for everybody to, to hear this stuff. So, yeah, I think we're just, look, we got 38 mushers in this race. There's, um, you know, 38 times 16 dogs, whatever that is uh you know there's several hundred dogs out there going and blasting off across the state you know i think that everybody has like a natural like attraction to negative news 608 60 uh, 608 dogs i think everybody has a natural attraction to negative news you know it's this is the news that broke through to 
the mainstream. It's on, you know, ESPN, you know, wouldn't it be cool if ESPN hit us up and said, Hey, isn't it cool that, you know, you have all this strong female, um, mushers that are kind of competing and in some situations actually doing a lot better than the male mushers. And that's a kind of a, like a unique, this might be the only sport where males and females are competing on an even playing field. And there's some amazing storylines about in the junior I did a ride and the, and the, all these races that have happened this year. And, and um, going into this, I did a ride and know like the only thing that we're going to, you know, the, the only way that the mushing gets to the mainstream is by a huge negative story. And I, you know, that's just says like, it's just the world we live in, man. This is the world we live in and there's bad things happen in uh, every, you know, setting uh whether it's in the mushing community or it's uh you know in your work or whatever like shit bad shit happens and yeah like i said i just don't feel like we really have i don't think our our opinions uh really matter um and they're not worth sharing um and in, and like i said this is a mushing alaska podcast we're going to talk about alaska and mushing and dogs and that's the best way for us to move forward. That's what I think. Yep. And the one thing that I would just slightly add to things is um, I wish that the timing of this was, was handled maybe, maybe differently or earlier. I mean, it's tough to say that now, right. But, you know, for this to be the main thing that we're talking about, literally as we walk into the Iditarod is, is tough. And so, you know, I hope that maybe, maybe situations like this down the road are maybe they consider that, you know, because, um, like Sean just said, there's a lot of other storylines that we can be talking about as we prepare to, you know, start the race. And unfortunately we're not really focused on a lot of that. So, uh, but with that, I think we've said what we need to, and I think it's time that we move on to uh, some other news. And Sean, I know that you were at the Junior Iditarod, and so I think we should start there. Yeah, I mean, I kind of blew it seeing like the winners and stuff because I wanted to go snowboarding. Oh, it was excuse really nice. me, it was really nice out. And sorry, Emily, I missed you, but um, I saw. I saw at least a musher come in and made a quick said a quick hello, but um, it was just uh, cool to see. You know, I got there and and it was it was a really nice day. There's a little bit of fog on the lake, and the second the last musher came in, and he he was super stoked. Uh, maybe it was she. I couldn't. They're all bundled up, and I was just kind of lurking in the background, just kind of watching and and seeing you know the family of the musher c- celebrate. And, uh, yeah, you know, three wins by Emily, uh, you know, Matt, I'm Matt Pavelio is a friend of mine and his daughter is now completed three, uh, junior Iditarod. There's a lot of mushers in the race that are, um, multi finishers. I think the second place finisher, um, has been second place quite a few times uh to emily who's almost won almost every race she's been in um and i am i mean you know i don't really i I, real quickly i want to keep up with everybody yeah 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 yeah. real quickly i want to give a shout out to morgan martins he kept it really close with emily throughout i was watching the tracker pretty consistently throughout the weekend and i mean even just looking at like into eagle quest oh i guess the the time differential is not quite there but like i mean literally breathing down her back i think they were separated by 13 minutes and then it was 19 minutes and then um you know, it ended up being 29, almost 30 minutes. Um, but I thought Morgan did great. Um, 
And then I also wanted to give a shout out to the rookie of the year, which is Aunt Addie Ann Randall. We talked about her in a previous episode. She is hoping to become the youngest to uh, at least attempt and hopefully finish the Iditarod um, because I think her birthday is literally the day of or the day before the Iditarod in 2026, I think. is. Don't quote me on that. But uh, so want to give her a little bit of a shout out as well. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's exciting to see. There's I think there's like 20 or 20, 20 some odd kids here um i think that that's great i i wouldn't know much about junior i did rods in the past numbers at least but i mean i think 20 is is pretty solid john i don't know if you have any thoughts on that yeah i mean i i i try my best to network my way through uh the mushroom community but the reality is i've met still not even half of the folks involved with it um and so there's a lot of names that I don't recognize, but that doesn't mean they don't deserve all the credit in the world. I'm not like an expert on everything and really anything. Uh, wait, wait, but, wait, wait, wait. You're not an expert on everything or anything? Yeah, dude, I'm just a fraud. Um, Damn, and, dude, I'm not trying to call you out like that. Sorry, man. It's all, it's all love. It's bro. all good. It's all love. I don't know. I know it's all love, but I'm just shook up a little bit about this week's stuff going on and this, and this is a really tough race junior i did rod is not just 150 miles it's a little bit longer i think it's almost a somewhere close to 160 and it's two really long runs with the long rest and the, that rest is challenging because some some of these dog teams are pretty well trained and they're not like maybe they're not but they're not maybe like ready to, to just kind of lay down for a super long rest like that um, so they, I think, what was the rest? Is it eight or 10 hours? It's 10 hours, right? I uh, don't know that. I'm not yeah, go to Eagle. Pretend. If you look at the times in and time out on Eagle quest, uh, oh no. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's where they turn around. So you have, uh, leave it 18. That's six. Uh, yeah. So it's 10 hours, 10 hours, 10 hours that they had to rest. So 10 hours is like a long, it's a pretty long rest for a team to be able to like just kind of have, have a meal and go to sleep like you might be thinking about feeding to a snack and then maybe a light meal in between with a nap in between and afterwards and so it's i don't know it's there so there's i think it's a kind of tricky format with having a long run and a long rest and a long run it's it's uh it it's People view it as like the junior. It's a junior idea or a junior kind of race. In some ways, this race is like harder just because you have these like two really long runs and a long rest. And so, you know, good job to everybody. And uh, these are some tough, tough girls and tough boys that got out there and, and did this thing. Oh yeah, and yeah. the dogs, of course, are incredible, and you can tell you can tell the kids really have a special connection with the dogs, and and that it's a really good way to teach us, you know someone that's fourteen, fifteen, sixteen years old how to persevere and and uh, you know get some self confidence and uh, do something like one hundred and sixty miles into the middle of nowhere with. 10 dogs and coming back in one piece and, and they all clearly knew seemed like they there's maybe the race didn't go perfectly for everybody but you, you see a lot of talented young mushers in this race yeah yeah i mean over half maybe 70 percent just doing a quick look at it finished with 10 dogs so you know Damn. you'd like to see that and um yeah it'll be it'll be not it'll be cool to see um these names as they continue to grow and develop you know emily has one more uh one more year left to run this race so she can go her this win was uh, tides the record for the most so she she could win next year and, and set the record uh it'll be interesting to see how some of those other names beneath her also you know, if they're going to step up and compete 
give her some competition or, um, you know, but we'll be excited to root those folks on as we always are. Anything else on the uh, junior I did or odd, Sean? Mm, did yeah, you talk I mean, to anyone while you were there? I, I said a quick hello to some the Schlossers who were out on the trail, the brothers uh, helping out with volunteering for the race. And I, I might have, I was, uh, I was pretty tired and I wasn't like feeling very social. Um, but I uh, talked with, I believe it was Emily who won the Goose Bay, but I didn't know it was her. <laughs> so I like, she was all bundled up and I was all bundled up. And I was like, is that Emily? I don't know. I could just ask, but I didn't ask. And then I just, we just like the conversation and, and then I just walked away and I, sometimes I'm weird. Sorry. I mean, you know. It is what it is. I don't know. Yeah. So you said Emily won the Goose Bay? Um, right. I think so. Who won the Goose? Who won the Goose Bay? It was it? Is it? You can Google it real quick. Goose hey. Bay one fifty. Believe it was won by Emily Kroll. Or... Oh, 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 oh! I I was just mixing up. I was like, wait, I didn't realize that. Emily was in Robinson was in okay just a misunderstanding yeah. on my part all right uh um, I did not see Emily Robinson there no I was there briefly and I I it was like I came a little bit too late so I just saw like tail end of things got you uh so you also over the weekend we're posting some stuff from the Ferrandi. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I firstly, I don't, I wanted to proceed everything I'm about to say with just a reiteration of I've been in the mid distance and long distance scene for, I've participated in it for five years. I've been still involved with it peripherally and, and made good friends with everyone in that, not everyone with some of the people in that race and hope to continue to make those connections in the, the sprint racing world is is really honestly completely separate. There is some, I mean, communication between both worlds, but like the dogs that are in these events are different than the dogs that are in mid distance and long distance. Like they're you don't like if 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 the mid distance and long distance dogs ran most of them if they ran in the Ferrandi they would get last place. And if the uh, sprint dogs ran in the Iditarod, they would probably, I mean, even if they trained all year for it, it would still not, probably wouldn't perform as well. Um, so, you know, for those naturally, that there's just other skill sets in the dogs. They're running upwards of 20 miles an hour. You know, so they're these dogs are kind of sprint dogs, and they're they got a little more of a houndy background. You, uh, you can see big floppy ears and shorter coats and uh, long strides, and uh, they, um, yeah, they're just faster. Uh, so they're going and there, and there's like a finer margin for error because you're running 25 miles to 29 miles ish Friday. You do it again Saturday, you do it again Sunday, and the fastest lap time wins. So you should literally, if you have one tangle or you have one wrong turn or you crash your sled, like that could be the difference between fourth place and 10th place, you know? And whereas I did a rod, like I can pull over, stop my dogs, give them a pet, you know, uh, re put on some new booties and, take a piss and then get back on the sled. And it's like that, that might not even really affect how quickly like the dogs probably benefit from that stop and probably doesn't affect, you know, your competitiveness. So with this, there's just like a really fine margin for error with how your run goes and how smoothly it is and how fast you go. You know, dogs obviously start off a lot faster at the, at the, gate and then they're kind of a little calmer as they roll into the finish line and 
yeah, they start with really, I don't think it's like an open class. Like you think you can have, usually people don't do more than 20 dogs, but yeah, you know, some people will start with that many dogs and finish with, you know, a few, a few less, uh, and, you know, put some young dogs in the start, let them run the first day, see the experience, see the people, see the other dogs, get the stoke happening and then just send them home right after that first one, just so they got that exposure and you can bank that for next year. Um, but yeah, it was cool to see the whole scene and then it's uh, a lot of respect to what those guys are doing. The strategy is kind of completely different and I was fascinated by it and I learned a lot and I still have a lot to learn about it. And uh, congratulations to the rookie winner, Annie from Quebec. And the second place was Remy Costa, who's been winning a lot of these sprint races um, in North America. Uh, Annie and Mallow Street, is her last Annie name. Annie Mallow. And, uh, and then Bud, Buddy, Bud Streeper, Buddy Streeper. See, like, I, I, I don't know. I, like, literally saw Buddy, Buddy Streeper for the first time this weekend. And they were like, the only, only reason I knew it was him was because someone was like, hey, look, it's the Streeper guy. And I was like, oh. That's what he looks like. So, yeah, I mean, like, I'm not, I'm learning. I'm learning a lot about, about the sprint we're, world. We're, all, we're both learning here, man. Yeah. Um, but it was really cool to see. And it's fun because it's a real competition. And I did ride, of course, it's a real competition, but in Anchorage, it's, it's ceremonial. And so it was fun to see these people kind of in race mode and they're not messing around and, and, you know, and I don't think like a lot of fans, like, I don't think they like, know like, what, like, like they, they don't know like that there's a like pretty intense competition that's going on. Obviously some fans do, but they're just like, Oh, look, like there's sled dogs. Like they look, look a lot smaller than I thought they were going to look. And they're different than I thought they were going to look. And I tell people like, yeah, they're going to do this again tomorrow. And they're like, wait, they do it again. I'm like, yeah. And again on Sunday. And they were like, wait, what? You know, big, so people don't, not everyone knows all the rules. And, um, so it was, and I was trying to do my best to learn them, but yeah, it was, it was cool to see. It was, it was a cool experience and it's a fun social thing too. There's a carnival and there's an ice snow, snow sculpture competition and, you know, there's everyone's wearing fancy furs and stuff. And it was a, it was a fun vibe and I, it was similar to that. I did her at the start, but it's definitely a, u- unique in its own way too. Yeah, man. One of the videos that you took, um, one of the mushers was coming around and like making that right hand turn. And man, those dogs were just so powerful. I'm like, that turn, I mean, the musher made it look so easy. But in my head, I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, man, that turn is probably a little bit more technical, especially with 20 dogs pulling as fast as they are. Like, I don't know. I, I again, I'm just, I'm just a guy sitting on my, in my chair here in Atlanta, Georgia, but, uh, yeah, I thought just, I thought I love, I like those videos that you were sending. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, I didn't really plan to do it, but I just figured, yeah, we're mushing Alaska. I must put some videos of the dogs mushing. Um, nice. so yeah, I, you know, it was just a little something, something that, uh, people could see and, uh, yeah, I definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, anybody, uh, to come, go and check out the fur Rondi. It was a, it was a, the fur rendezvous. Like, like I'm confused talking about it. Like the fur rendezvous is a race. That's the three day race that just happened this weekend. But it's also like the whole week is fur rendezvous, like the carnival and the ice sculpting. And there's a talent show and there's a toilet seat race and there's running with the reindeer and there's all these things. It's all kind of, there's the, I did a rod start. There's the fur Rondi sprint race. There's, um all kinds of stuff going on and it's all it's a lot there's a lot going on and it's uh <laughs> kind of a little bit confusing so i'm trying to kind of get a clearer picture of things slowly but surely i remember you were kind of talking about this a little bit last year and and i my mind was blown because i was just like oh i didn't even know any of this went on like right before the i did her odds so um i'm sure as you continue to live there we'll continue to have your experiences and 
we'll learn more about those things along the way. Uh, yeah. One thing I did want to do is circle back around. We were having that conversation about Emily. Uh, Emily Kroll is the name of the girl who won the Goose Bay 150. Which I've like, dude, I've met her like four times. I've fucked up and I like don't know. I recognize faces and names and I struggle. So I'm sorry, Emily. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, congrats on your Goose Bay win. And, and she's like, honestly the reason i've seen her around so much is because she's volunteering at almost every event like she's just a genuine part of giving back to the community so nice. ton of respect there and that's what she was doing at the junior i did around right on um next up on the list just wanted to briefly talk about the i did a ride trail invitational i saw i think that started today or maybe yesterday i saw a picture um or a post that had some videos of all the the thick bike tires, you know, and them taking off. And I think I saw there was a 350 mile version. And then there's the uh, getting all the way to Nome. And, you know, for me, Sean and I have talked about it in, in uh, prior episodes. You know, I used to do triathlons. I still intend to do more. I just got to get this hip of mine right. Um, and so anytime, you know, we talk about the racing with with uh, the whether it's running or whether it's swimming or biking, I'm always interested. And, in, you know, just like the idea of of getting on a bike and doing the Iditarod route is crazy to me. What, what do you what do you have any thoughts on on anyone? Yeah. Do you know anyone who's done that before? Or? Not like personally, I've met a couple of them on the trail. And, you know, there was like this, you sit in a 100 happened a week or two ago. And one of the Barrington yep. twins, I believe it was Christy and Andy, uh, the husband and wife, um, ran the, uh, did that race. And, um, and yeah, and then the ITI, I did our trail invitational happened. And, uh, yeah, those guys, that's a crazy undertaking. I mean, they did a ride sled dog race is also a crazy undertaking but in a completely different way and uh i wow i mean imagine just even going like 200 miles let alone 350 let alone a thousand and uh it's and then when you go on a bike and it's like sometimes the bike trail is great but a lot of the time it ain't you know a lot of times that's a soft trail or uh and, and that's really the big Biggest hindrance to a bicycle out, out in winter conditions. The fat tire bike can tolerate some soft, soft trails, but if you get enough fresh snow or you get warm enough temperatures, you're probably walking the bike. Is the reality, and so I think some people bike it, and some people like walk it on skis. Um, and I think it depends on the year. And again, I'm still learning, but. Uh, I think it depends on the year. Sometimes the bike crushes it and wins the race by like like all the top much all the top I, ITI guys are have bikes. And some years the bikes are middle back of the pack, and this people skiing you know are out in front. And so I'm really curious about how the whole ITI scene is. And I wish I wish I knew more. I wish I had done a little bit more research before recording today, honestly. But um, pretty pretty cool going and do a human powered all the way across Alaska or even if you're doing the you sit in a 100 or the the ITI 350 all those things I mean just absolute bonkers so I was just looking up last year the winner won in a little under uh 17 days so they average but I guess if you're on a winning pace you're averaging roughly 55 to 60 miles a day so that's it's unsupported too like they're not sending out stuff to my knowledge to the checkpoints and whatnot like there might be things that they can like get at checkpoints i don't know man but i they always i always hear it's unsupported is the word i hear around that race Whatever we'll have to fo- we'll have to follow up on on this i'm i'm interested it's an easy thing for us to get lost and go down the rabbit hole on right now though and and uh we'll we'll save that for you another should ask i bet you some of the people you're gonna have on 
are going to know a good bit about that. So, yeah, I mean, I think I did her on. Christy will be a perfect person to ask. I bet you she at least has some information or knowledge more so than than we do, clearly. Um, so, yeah, and then the other thing that I wanted to bring up is I saw this post the other day and I wanted to share it. And I wanted to get your your experience. And that is um, that the Mushergrams, uh, they're doing that this year. And I just want to read this post for anyone who's not watching on YouTube. So the call center opens today. This was a post five hours ago. So we're recording this on the 26th. The call center opens today. Call the race information line that is active from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Alaska time, starting today throughout the end of the race. You can call and talk to our awesome volunteer call center team for information about the race, including musher tracking, standings, insider issues, and general information. This also means it's time for mushergrams. The call center representative will take your name, what musher you would like, like it to and what you would like your message to be and they will physically handwrite that note that will make its way up the trail to the musher and so uh i just like bringing this up when sean you know, hopefully most of you all are are listening to to more than one episode and no sean's story but you know like sean had that last minute entrance into the 20 i did a rod and we couldn't get there. And, you know, like the least that I felt like I could do was um, send him a, a message with the mushergram. And, you know, what I did for him was I made a post and it just was like, hey, Sean's doing this race. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Just any words of encouragement. And, you know, along the way, they they deliver it to Sean and when when or if in sean's case it's when he has a chance to read but in other mushers uh, uh cases it might be if they have that chance um they get a chance to read it and you know i know for sean that it was probably special in some way and i don't know what's your what was your experience like with those musher grams and, and just anything you want to add on that um yeah i think i got them in galena maybe and you know i had no idea what the hell a mushergram was i just get this fat stack of cards handwritten i didn't know if they writ if like you wrote them brennan or whoever was it was from wrote them i didn't know any of those details but you know it was pretty welcomed and uh i'm 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 a little softer than some of these guys out. I mean, I I did a rod trail this year. I'm a little, a little. Uh, there's might be some people like me out there too. But yeah, it was it meant a lot. And you're really alone out there. So especially if it's someone that you, you know, I mean, it, it meant a lot coming from people I didn't know. But that, almost in some ways, like it coming from like your buddy that you grew up with that you hadn't talked to in 12 years, or it came from your mom, you know, and everything in between, it was, it was pretty special. And it was a nice, just like 15 minute mental break from just the grind, the mental grind. And, uh, and reading those things, I was tears flowing down, hitting the cards, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> ugly crying. It was pretty, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's already, yeah, certainly just you talking about it. I was getting a little emotional. And, uh, so yeah, that was a really fun, surprise i think even the mushers that don't maybe have the time or just the bandwidth to read that stuff uh out on the trail i think they still do read it like after the race so um yeah. means a lot means a lot i think for everybody and there might be like a couple people that are like i don't need no car. i'm pretty sure everybody in the, in the race is thankful to get some get some love and support out there so uh yeah do it if you can and it's free right i mean it's pretty yeah. good pretty good little system yeah i mean it was my experience was as easy as calling the number that was on that post and um you will get a different person each time 
I remember that I know that when I did it, I spoke to a like it sounded like it was an older woman and uh, I was like, yeah, so I, I'd like to send my brother, Sean Underwood. And she was like, oh, you're Sean Underwood's brother? And I was like, you know, like you got thrown in last minute. So I'm like, I, I, you know, like, how do you, how do they even know you? And they're like, oh man, that, and just like, just instantly already, I was just like, oh man, this is awesome. And uh, so I had like a very, uh, I don't know, like 10 minute conversation with this woman. And then I, um, I, I sent my, le- my message and she wrote it down and, you know, then you got it I'm somewhere along the way. I'm betting with rookies, it means maybe a little more than, you know, if, imagine doing this race like 10 times and you like drop bags aren't even stressful at that point. You're just kind of like, right. yeah, I know the drill or, you know, you just been through it a lot and it's like, maybe maybe they maybe that this is kind of corny those kind of guys and girls but yeah i mean i bet you being out here for the first time on the trail and getting getting these little cards are is nice nice gesture at the very very least i'm thinking about doing some some randoms this year just like just like uh maybe someone we've had on as a guest or maybe someone like i could plant a seed for to get on afterwards be like hey man you're doing great. I can't wait to talk to you <laughs> on the pod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember all your uh, stories. We'll we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just blowing smoke up my ass. But uh, anyways, so yeah, that was that was what we want to talk about in the intro before we uh, kind of talk a little bit about our guest for this episode, and that is Mats Peterson. And we had a good time recording with him. Super nice guy. His his story is is uh you know the guy is dedicated to the sport and the passion is is real. I mean, as is the case with everyone we have on, but this guy is traveling to the Iditarod year in and year out, all the way from freaking uh Sweden. Sweden. And it's just like that there's a lot of intricacies that are involved with coming to Alaska year in and year out. And, you know, he started in 14 coming over and I think he probably would have done consecutive until now if it weren't for COVID. And we kind of talked about that. So, um, you know, I was super interested to see, just listen to him talk about that travel process, but, yeah, it just uh the guy is dedicated. He's got two kennels. He's traveling across uh the country for this race. One thing we didn't talk about, but in looking for some pictures for him, he, I think he's got four or five kids. I mean, the guy like how does he sleep, you know? <laughs> well, he said he's very good at sleep deprivation. And uh is not as face at, by it as most might be. I think he's you know, he also was uh, told us that he's not necessarily out there to, you know, but do everything he can to get as far as high up in the race as possible. Like he's finished in the money, but, you know, I don't think he's really expecting a top 10 finish, but he might, that might end up, this could be a good year to get in the top 10 for him, but yeah, that's not like his expectation or goal. It's just to have a happy, healthy looking dog team. And, you know, I think that's every musher's goal, but you can just see by his resume, he's been like a, a good, like just solid finishes, middle of the pack. And, uh, and then he's got an amazing thing going up above the Arctic circle. I mean, he's literally like 200 plus kilometers above the Arctic circle, dude. It's crazy. Uh, and he's, so he's, he said he has snow on the ground 11 months a year. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, so his dogs are he's, his dogs are running most of the year. I think they take a spring break and a fall break, but they're you know it just means that he's dealing with probably the what did he say? He said something about how he like his dogs just have like tough feet because they're just always running. Yeah, and he's like oftentimes when other people are putting booties on, he's not, and his dogs have impeccable feet. You know, even sometimes not 
going on those runs with with booties and some obviously he's going to be wearing some booties out on the trail but his he was he was thin yeah his dogs have have some hardy feet and he's bred you know alaskan dogs with some of the scandinavian lines and he's kind of got a diverse group of dogs and uh and and it, some incredible experience and he's been a mainstay in in this race for better part of 10 years or 15 years and uh yeah it was it was cool to talk to him i'd, I'd never really had I, we had we met like in 2016 maybe and then or 17 and i haven't really talked to him much and it was a brief encounter and so it was really cool to sit down with him a little bit we have a, a few a, a number of mutual friends and he was just talking about the philanthropic side of like the race and the community and how he comes here two months early and he gets he's got his buddy linwood field feeler that's uh you know a top 10 i did or i'd retired musher um he, he is getting to stay at his place and then when those kinds of mushers come up to sweden he has an open door policy you know come and stay at the house for a night or two and maybe uh you know check things out and he'll show you around and and so it's cool to see kind of this gap that's been bridged between the mushing scene in alaska and north america and and then going in bleeding into norway and and uh sweden and so uh cool to have you know representation from across the across the pond in the, in the race and on the podcast yeah you know the one thing that kind of stood out to me that was apparent was that he's clearly well respected and liked among mushers um i'm sure back home but in in alaska you know he he comes over and and he's able to like hang out with his friend not hang out but he's able to live at, where his friends are and like people put him up and put up his dog team and i was just because that was one thing that I was like man how does he do this like i guess he has to like rent s space every time he comes here or whatever but no he's got these relationships with folks and um that stood out to me and then like you were saying just his open door policy of like come to my kennel and check it out i don't out. think he's like extending that policy to like everybody you know like don't just show up to his kennel maybe no but no like, but but he his know. doors are open is what he was saying and you know i thought that that was you know just trying to bridge that gap you know i think there's a vision that he has where the alaska mushing scene the united states mushing scene is more unified with things on a global level and um so just it was a great great um a great dog man and um you know it was nice to get to know him and you know i hope you guys enjoy this episode all righty folks welcome back to the mushing alaska podcast we've got our next guest he's a seven time iditarod finisher he's coming into his eighth iditarod stand by for the pronunciation <laughs> yes welcome on to <laughs> i should have asked again before you didn't do it dude you should have. i didn't i didn't sean you're gonna fill me in welcome into the podcast sean fill me in with the name no, how do you say no, it? it's you dude it's all you mots peterson Ah, oh, awesome. That's that's correct. Thank you for having me. All right. Nice. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So welcome on. And um, you know, you and I had a chance to kind of talk a little bit before before we pressed record. And um, you know, welcome over here. You've been what for two months now, a little under two months. Yeah, thank you. I've been back and forward. I've been um uh... You know, with my logistic coming in with the dog from Sweden, we have to fly fly it more times. So I've been over one time in January together with my Norwegian friend Ebbe, and then we put up uh, we took the dogs here for the Casco Casco 300, which he ran. So it was, was a good like he did a I did a qualifier, and then I went home again, and then bring more dogs. Um, and I come here to and now I stayed at Linwood Fielders Kennel in Willow. So I train from here now with my with my core and with my team. 
That's awesome. Uh, I saw, yeah, I saw Eba in the, that was in the Cusco. Is, so are y'all related? No, no, we're not related. He's not even Swedish. He's Danish. Oh, <laughs> but he has also I thought I saw the same last name, right? Winstrup Peterson, and he has uh, two two uh, last names. Yeah, no, no, we are not. We are not. We just uh, friends and buddies. And uh, I know we're going over here, and we have a chat. And I told like, yeah, if you if you go over and you pay your own flight ticket and you bring my dogs, then you can use them in Casco. So we we took uh, yeah, the core from from my leaders and so on, and he he ran the Casco, and he did really well. You know, there was a qualifier for him. It's a top race. Um, I'm very pleased with that. So so he did a good good work with the dogs. Awesome. Yeah. I, that's so funny. Cause I saw the last name and I was like, that's gotta be like Mats's, you know, cousin or something. And sure enough, it was actually like your friend. What, like, it's kind of, that's kind of, yeah. it's, it's, it'll be easier to remember that he's working with you and, and one of your friends. But, um, you know, before I ask you more about this winter, I think, uh, you know, something that every musher gets asked all the time and, and I'm curious what your story is, just how you, you know, you grew up in Sweden. I don't know anything about that region of the world. And I know, I know there's a mushing scene up there and Norway gets a lot of, uh, you know, we hear a lot about Norwegian mushing scene for sure. But, well, you know, how did you get into the sled dog life? Yeah, thank you. I'm just, uh, my grandfather had dogs so and was always uh, working with dogs like he had got uh, not sled dogs, but we worked in with taking care of dogs and homeless dogs and so on. And he was my biggest idol when I, when I grew up, my, my grandfather. So I helped him every summer with the dogs and so on. And I told him I'm going to get, get dogs when I grown up, get more of my own dogs and so on. So, so, so what happened is like, I uh, work in ambulance nurse and uh, firefighter and it was a really good thing to do that. And same time, um, start with dogs because we, have good shifts to work and I play ice hockey also. So I have lots of things going on. Like I saw I was a goalie, goalkeeper. So ah. I mean to to the to the machine world because I, I really like wildlife and, and everything around that. So I've been counting wild animals in the mountains and going out with dogs. It's what was my more or less my my passion, you know. So and then come into it more and run a couple of this uh, Norwegian Finnmark Slöpet and those races and, and so on. So and got hooked, got hooked and so on. And then in 2002, I think it was the first time I went over to Alaska and, and met uh, up to Jeff King in Denali. And uh, I have a handler that worked for me that come to his place. And so we got connected and so on. And I asked if I, I could come back and buy one dog one day. And I, he told me, sure, come come back here and so on. And I, I got a super good female, M. Shasta, from him then. And was a leader, a bitchy small leader, a bit like Jeff's dogs are, <laughs> but yeah. So it was, uh, that was the first time con connection with Alaska, but I live in North Sweden in, in a place called Kiruna, and we are actually really famous to be like a bit of a mushy mecca in North Europe, super good trails, like inland, a little bit like Fairbanks area. We are 220 kilometers above the polar circle, so it's high up wow. in, in cold weather and so on. So, so I'm, I'm as we have a really good good spot for doing what we love to do. Man, that is really far north. I always like that was something I learned recently. My <clears throat> cousin what spent some time in uh uh going to school in Norway. And it's like the southernmost part of Norway is like at at the a similar latitude or maybe even farther north than Fairbanks. And and yeah, you know, northern Sweden being 200 plus kilometers north of the arctic circle so that's got to be a quite the quite the winter experience up there with the darkness um and and your so your income has been firefighting and that gives you right that's what you said yeah that's what i started out more like ambulance nurse when i went from firefighter to ambulance nurse and i placed ice hockey but then i Stopped with that a couple of years ago and only run my own business. So I run my tour business up in Sweden now. So we have like one wilderness canal off the grid that we run tours from four day, eight day tours there. And then we have a, a canal close to Kiruna. So that's uh, we're running shorter tours and a little bit. I have my race dogs there also and so on. So I, we are a really good, good area for, for doing what we love to do. But we also have very much uh, 
Aurora, like in all the lights in that area. So we got guests coming there and we can show them, show them the area and show them the dogs and so on. What I like to do, I, I really like to educate people who come to us and showing that how well we take care of the dogs, how much they important for us. And so everybody who come to us, they come home to our home. They come home to our kennel and can see the dogs where our family, where we live and so on, which is something I, I like to show and I like to, to get people more involved and in understanding what we do. You know, I'm curious about is is your uh is the weather in, in Karuna is it similar to Alaska? Like, is is it longer of a winter, or is it the seasons kind of similar, or what? No, it's long. We have a little longer. I think more like you see, like more like north slopes around there, above Fairbanks area. So we're running dogs all April and beginning May in the mountains close to us and so on. So we have pretty we have a long long season, which is very good. And my my dogs is running at least eleven months per year. Or my 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 dogs running, so we don't have an off season in that. We, only a couple of weeks in the summer when it's too warm, but it's it's not so much, you know. And then we train all May and up in June also. So, so so we are almost a year round thing with the dogs. So we don't, and I believe in that very much to prevent injuries on dogs and so on. So they're really well prepared and they're running most of the years and so on. So so and then I, I like that concept. Yeah, who are we talking with, Brendan? That they said that their dogs only take off three weeks in the spring and three weeks in the fall. I don't remember who it was, but yeah, there's something to be said for just like your dogs are always moving, always strong, and obviously you have some downtime. But um, you know, yeah, that 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 that's there's something to be said for that. You know, you just don't have like some of those issues and injuries, and you know, you might have your dogs might have tougher feet and 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 just less you know you, they're just tougher overall it's you know being able to run all, all year they never are not in shape you know hey, it's, it's funny that you imagine the feeds because I, I see the difference you know just with the feeds i love that my dog standing on gravel you're standing on stones year around almost and then of course the snow in the winter but they got tough feeds they build up feeds they're running with the like many months of the year and so on. So when I come here, I didn't have booties on, on my dogs and everybody around is, oh, you don't have booties on the dogs. I said, no, we, we don't run no more. We so much home with booties, you know, even on the longer training and so on. Only when it's super cold, when it's super cold, I use booties on the dog. But I think it's so, also a way for me to build up the dogs, really good, good feeds, uh, working with the feeds, give them, of course, good nutrition, fish, good food and so on. But we are not using as far as close uh, borders as you are hearing in alaska in, in my kennel at least that is such a what an asset man i mean like <laughs> dude i i mean i can't tell you how i mean a, a, you know anyone in the mushroom community knows what it's like to just deal with foot problems it's just such a such a pain in the ass it's so nice to have like just bulletproof feet you know i've had dog teams that I've worked I've been, with that. I've been in other places also. I've been in Cantwell. I've been in Mike Santos' place. I've been up there, a really beautiful area, and they use booties, incredible much booties on the because they're running on the Ali Highway and they're on that. So that was very tough for the feet. So I understand mm -hmm. that. Maybe it will be the same here. But I also know that there are some different in the conditions here, uh, com com where I come from and here. Also with the snow conditions, warm and cold and stuff like that. So we doesn't really have an issue like you have sometimes with the chicken legs if you know what i mean and so on with the oh yeah surface and so on we I don't, there's barely anybody if you see in scandinavia who use leggings for the dogs for example brennan what do you know about chicken legs <laughs> chicken legs um I, I are we talking about i don't i don't know where you're going here well, well that's what he just said he said chicken legs i was just wondering <laughs> if you knew about chicken legs yet um Barbecue. Just, <laughs> just uh, go ahead and fill me in, so I don't look completely like an idiot here. <laughs> well, my understanding of what chicken legs are, Matt's can back me up, maybe, but is uh, you know, when you're running in certain snow conditions, the snow kicks up onto the dogs uh, right above their wrist and the back, like in the back, like kind of where they're like a human calf might be, or your forearm. It's essentially your forearm. So in the front legs, their forearm, the snow will ball up onto their fur. It'll it'll stick to the fur on their like on their right forearm. Here. Yep, right there. And then the weight of the snow will pull the hairs out of their 
leg and you have just like some bare skin that shows up and then that becomes now it doesn't have the insulation it's got the cold exposure it can scab up a little bit so that's why you might see some dogs with leggings maybe they it, it, all it takes is for the fur to get pulled off and then it's not gonna it takes a long time to grow back and so once it's exposed and it's below zero you got to have at least protection from the wind. And even if there isn't any wind, you're running nine miles an hour. So there's nine mile an hour wind, you know, yeah, well, so many prevent it, you know, they use it to prevent it. If they have some problem with before, of course, and so on. So they, they use it more, you know, because it can be an issue, you know, when they're losing all the hair from, from, from that, and it doesn't really get back it fast, you know, so, so that that's chicken leg. Correct. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, and and it's like hot chicken leg because like it'll be the skin can be like pink like a chicken's leg or whatever. You know, that's is my true. my understanding. But yeah, sometimes Thank you. yeah, I Thank mean like you. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> well, it's like Jeff, you know, Jeff's got some like houndy dogs, and and the more houndiness you got in your huskies, the less like there's there's the, what what's the upside of a houndy dogs? The upside is they're faster. Maybe they in some ways may you know they're sprintier. They have Maybe there's some extra athleticism, you know, it's, it's a little ambiguous. There's some arguments to be made one way or the other, but they are certainly less, less, uh, robust to the cold, the more hound is in your, your team. And, um, so like, I remember Zig, who is like, you know, the matriarch of his kennel for, you know, 2010 to 2017 or whatever, she would she was uh, decked out and she looked like Kevin Durant out there. She was, you know, she had leggings on and, you know, it's like uh, she had all the gear on and she was fine. She did fine. But that's what happens. Like and, and Jeff would always argue. Would you rather have a dog with a short coat and then put an insulated jacket on the dog mm -hmm. and put on the extra gear and have the dog be fine in the cold, relatively fine in the minus 30? Or would you rather have the big fluffy dog who you can't really, you know, shave their fur off? No, you could, but you're not. And then you're running at 30 degrees and they're kind of hot, right? So that was what his, it's good. It's an, it can be an, there's upsides and downsides to it is my point. Right on, man. Anyway, so back to Mott's. Sorry for talking. Um, so you have an employee. Who's my friend Nathan? I think, right? Yeah, awesome. I have actually two Nathans this year. I'm super. They're not deployed. They're from US, but they're there and and uh, helping mm. us out, the running dogs and so on. So they're not uh, in, in that way. But super. I'm really pleased with the two Nathans I got. You know, one has been in Jeff's kennel and one has been in Sevis kennel. So I'm super happy with those guys. They do great work. So I'm very, very, we're lucky to have them them this year. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I hope to. I, I yeah, I hope to see Nathan. I think he, I heard he was coming, coming, uh, coming this way soon. But um, so you've been here for two months. You're training out. Of, or, there, you know, maybe stayed out. So much Swedish ladies. What's That's that? Probably so much Swedish ladies. Ah, love him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's falling in love over there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> hey, before uh, we transition into the season, my question that I wanted to ask in regards to the mushing scene there in Sweden, um. And as it relates to you, is like what other events do you target on uh, a yearly basis um, outside? I mean, you've done this stretch with Iditarod. Um, I know that what the two that you you ran six, seven in a row, and then you had two where you missed, but that was COVID. So, um, but you know, I'm just curious what other uh, local races either in sweden or in the area that you like to target on a yearly basis as well yeah got it uh i done pinmark Löpet, norwegian's longest race and payment loop at those races 10 years before i come to edit road so i done all these races in scandinavia more or less before and then when i started focus on edit road it's like then we're coming over in january and it's not so much uh races before we come over like here and so on so so what I've done is a couple of Denali doubles we've done. We signed up for some Casco, Testamina 200, those st stuff like here. So when I come over here, I like to do one race. At, this year we did a Casco before I did, or at least one, two, three hundred miles race before I did what we do. And the home in Sweden, we also 
when we come home, we probably want to do one one race. We have uh, the week we come home called the Baku Trail and stuff like that. So so we're doing some races. Try to do both. But when you're leaving already in January here, it's not so many races going on in Scandinavia in January and not so many races here. So what I like to focus the years I'm, I'm doing the races in Alaska to focus to be here and do two or three races in Alaska that year, for example. Yeah. But we put a lot of training to the dogs. So we do, for me, it's not only about the races. It's like we, we need, we train, we put lots of miles to the dogs. We're camping. I have my solid dogs now. It's only one dog with three years. The rest are older. So I don't really need them to learn to camping anymore, something like that. They, they really know that deal, you know. So they're really behaved and calm, and which I like uh, my dogs to be when we're coming to a checkpoint and resting good and stuff like that. So. So, so basically, I've done all these races before. I started with this and have the two COVID years off. So that that's my last twenty years. Right, and uh, again, the other thing I was curious about is your setup back home. So, you know, the intention was to bring over sixteen dogs. You were explaining to me before we recorded that uh, some of the some of the travel uh, laws changed that prevented that. But back home, I'm just curious how like. I think I was listening to your podcast with Robert Forto. I think I understand that you have two different kennels or two different locations. Is that right? Yeah, that's pretty new for me. I have wilderness kennel, which I love to be at really nice. There's off the grid. So we have we have some dogs there and doing longer tours, mostly like the guest comes for eight to day tours. But we also there ourselves, me and my wife and my family all summer and autumn and train the dogs. So it's a really cool, cool place just in the middle of nowhere. I got a chance to to get that. And then I have my base home in, in Kirna, also where my, my kids go in school and so on. So it's closer access for them to to go to school and, and so on. So we're a little bit split up in that way, but I really enjoy the new place. I think it's a beautiful area and it's just like in the middle of nowhere. So I'm, that's something we like to be with the dogs and do preparation for the race and, and that. So I'm, I'm really pleased with that. And you, you have how many dogs though? We got around 50 per camel, 50 per camel. It sounds maybe 100, 100, 100 plus, but it sounds much. But then it's also young dogs also and then puppies. And then you have like, if you're going out with guests, you need a couple of dogs for small teams. Like you go directly 40 dogs, a couple of guests driving and so on. So I'm, I've never been a super fan to have much dogs like in myself in that way. But around 50, 60 per camel is really that you can work out really fine. And then I leave here with some dogs also. So, so and I'm really interesting in bloodlines. I'm really interesting in in bloodlines in in dogs and mixing over. So I've been that's been one of my things, you know, being here. I was 2010. I had the chance to buy four of Jeff's dogs in Nome. Me and Pete Kaiser and Richie Deal when he finished, and Jeff actually told me then, give me a call and you can get some of the best dogs. I'm really pleased with that. So, so what I did then, then I went over to Scandinavia with the dogs and we we bred them with with Norwegian bloodlines and Swedish bloodlines, and we got a really good mix. I went to the best kennel star and I took two puppies from every breeding we did. So I got a really good mix there with good genetics, good leaders from Jeff together with some tough dogs from, from Norway and Sweden. So, so that's actually how I built up my race kennel the last years. And, and then I went over back here again, 2014, and did my first crazy race in Aditro with no snow. We stayed at Jake Berkowitz kennel and Alex Butte over there also. That's yeah. it. We had fun together. We had to travel every day to train, which was my rookie year that year. So, and then... From there on, I got some from dogs from Jake and with John Baker bloodlines, Paul Gebel bloodlines, Reddington bloodlines. I really have always had the really passion to to get in those type of bloodlines into to Scandinavia and so on. But we also learned much during the way how we to breeding and stuff like that. So, so it's been really really a passion for me to 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 work with that. Man, this is I got so many questions. Firstly, <laughs> <laughs> number number one, uh, could, the Fenmark the Fenmark slope it I can't pronounce right, but you've pronounced it beautifully. It was so sick when you said it. But uh, you know, can you compare and contrast those two major Norwegian races? You know, they're uh, like what like six hundred miles and two hundred miles or something, and. Uh, you know, you've run the Iditarod a number of times, you've run those a number of times. You have an you know expertise in both events and how they might be similar and different. And I'm just curious on your take on that. Yeah, this is really uh, interesting because uh, what I told to people who come over from from Alaska to do 
been marked, for example, that race and so on. I told them to the best way if you're going to do good in the race, like Dallas and those, you have to be there and prepare. You have to be there and prepare on the trails and what you're going to do, which he actually didn't do before he ran over first time. It was too short time there because I told him the most important thing, the difference between uh, within Alaska and Norway and so on is, of course, it's 100% the trails and 100% uh, condition, the snow condition, different type of snow and the area where you're running and so on. So all these things you put together, it's not like even if one race is 1,000 miles and one race is shorter, 600 miles, it's, it's totally different races, different type of strategy you need to do in this, those races. And, and uh, I, I really know it's from experience myself also that uh, spending time with the dogs, even if you, for example, I take Dallas as an example because he's been there two times, that uh, coming over from here with maybe pretty good conditions, generally like hard pack trails and coming to Norway with, with looser conditions and looser snow and in general and so on. There's different parts of the, the dog body you use and different parts. So I, if you want to do well and come over from Alaska, it's not like you have the best team in the world to be here and then it's a sex, successful in, in uh, Norway. It's not like that. You have to prepare. You have to be there. It was at least three months before to really settle into the area and do the race. So, and of course, there is different. You have road system, you have handlers helping and so on. So, so that's one of the biggest points where I love to be in Alaska and I love to be on myself with my team and no, no help. I don't bring a cell phone. I don't have anything on the trial. It's just me and the dogs for those days. And this is something I love. And this is something I really hope Alaska will stick to and have the races like this. You, you and the dogs that do the journey. You don't do it together with lots of people helping or big teams or handlers and so on. Because for me, it's get, then it's get, in different levels, you know, because when you're out there with the team, it's you and the dogs, and that's something I love to to be. Yeah, it is. It's lonesome out there. There's you don't see you don't see your your wife and kids out there on the Iditarod Trail. Maybe you do. Some people do. You know, Pete, Pete and Richie. Maybe they got they got to see their family at a couple of checkpoints. But yeah, it's expensive and it's tricky, and uh, and that's interesting though. Um, you know, Dallas is after. I feel like I don't know if we ever talked about this, Brennan. But that he's after like the triple crown, the coveted triple crown that's never been done by any musher ever. The Iditarod champion, the Yukon Quest 1000 champion, and the Fenmark Snow Pit. Yeah, but we imagine that we can do that. We can get the chance to people to do it, to fly back and forward. Wouldn't that be a dream? I've talked about so many years now that we... We should really hang up with like, uh, because it takes a lot of time for me to come over here, but I do it because I have passion for the sport, a passion for what I, I love to do. So that's my main thing, you know? So it's not like a, that I think I'm going to win. I did it every year. That's why I come over. It's more like I love, I love to be around there. I love the passion. I love to do as good as I can with my team of dogs and their capacity and my capacity to do it. So, but having a circle that we do two races in Alaska and two in Scandinavia every year, I think that would, for the sport, it will be so helpful, you know, and it's for for people to see uh, also in Scandinavia, to see these names coming over and, and participate in all races there and so on. But the biggest challenge to do that, I think, uh, money-wise, of course, in, in, in Scandinavia, you don't have so much prize money. But I think if you do something like that, maybe you can push up the prize money a little bit. But also the biggest challenge is the flights over. And... Uh, but if you are four or five teams, if you then can have a, a flight, like if you chair on a flight over together or something like that, then cooperate and five teams from, from Norway, Sweden can come over here and so on. I think that would be amazing for the sport. And I, I talked about many years and I really hope we can we can get together, all, everybody, and, and start thinking about it to make it happen because it's in all sports. I've grown up in hockey myself. I've been traveling around the world with hockey and so on. And same thing there, you know, you, you, you see different areas, you meet different people and so on. So I'm, I think that will be the right decision for our sport to grow and be better and so on. Also about, it's been so much better the last years about the animal about the welfare for the dogs, how we take care of dogs, everything like that. You know, that's something we, we're working on every year and we all get better on it and we get better as a team together with the vets and with the with the, with the the races and everything like that. So I think we, we are much more professional now than, than we have been ever before. I remember Dallas mentioning that that the, he was really impressed with just the organization of the Norwegian race and, and the, you know, the vet regulations and how they go about um, you know, with the that the the body scores and and that's something that's like new to Iditarod in the last few years. 
and uh yeah he was he was impressed by that so yeah it'd be cool to go up there sometime for for me i'm excited about that idea and and that'd be that's that'd be so cool to be able to take these iditarod teams that are fresh and they're they're or they're trained up you know and they they could take a few days off and then go and run another event you know um that i love that idea so you know uh, i know also it's lots of interest from both sides and i know yeah it's interesting but just have to keep it together and make the flights possible and stuff like that you know but i know it's a lots of passion in the world i know it's lots of people and much just from over here that really want to come over to see how it is to to be in scandinavia and racing there also and so the flight the flying brennan cut me off if you want but my question is go ahead i was just saying that the flying this is my was my already i had that queued up like 15 minutes ago flying with 14 to 20 dogs or whatever it is all across you know, a long way from Sweden to Alaska, which actually might like if you could do a direct flight, like you know, just go right over the North Pole, right? You know, just up right on over. But um how it like I've I've flown from with dogs from you know Anchorage or Fairbanks to Bethel, and that was pretty chill. Uh, you know, we had all the dogs on an air essentially an air cargo flight you know in their kennels secured there it's an hour and a half it's like no problem um but going that distance with that many dogs you know this is it like you i've heard people tell me yeah we have to find a bunch of friends and they can all fly with two dogs each or three dogs each or, or you know but i feel like i've heard people flying with their whole team it's like well, break it down break it down and the, the the thing what I doing is I, I fly with four dogs per flight. I bring over four dogs per flight, which is uh, working fine. Two times myself, one time a friend, and so on. And then my son from family coming. So it works that way. And it's, of course, the cheapest way you can do it. So so that's why I do it in a good way. I, I don't have a team around me. I'm I'm alone. Like, I'm a family home, but I, I'm doing this. You know, I'm working hard. I'm doing food drops myself. I've been here myself and training dogs myself, everything like that. So there's no big team around me when I'm here. So I, I do it because of the passion and so on. So it's like not the team Sweden, team Norway in that way it was before. So so that's absolutely the cheapest way. But now the flights, what is was complicated for me this year, they, they, re, they reduce it to two, two dogs per flight. And then it's totally mm. up to allow four dogs. Then it's totally different. But and also we fly one year we've been flying from from Germany direct flight over here, and so with oh. with three four teams with Norwegian it was 2015 16 or well, maybe 18 90 teams on the start line that year. So so we also done that and that works for sure if you have good uh, communication and if you are three or four big teams that that share on the costs then it works. But you have to cooperate then, which sometimes can be the problem. But you have to if you want to do it you have to cooperate and then. Flying from Iraq and, for example, Anchorage to to Reykjavik in Iceland or to to Sweden or one midland is just like that's that's no problem. And I can say the dogs we have, I mean, all the husky we have, they are probably the best dogs in the world to travel. They're super calm. They're super used to travel. They stay in sky kennels normally also when they go somewhere and like the battle guys and those guys you know, they they used to to go in in uh, in small crates and, and so on so it's there's nothing new for them when i take out my dogs in seattle when i'm flying here or something like that they just well, say fine we're going to take a pee and then go inside again so they have no problem with that so that's actually they're very calm and, and easy to travel with that's yeah i, I was i would figured that you that they, yeah you know maybe getting those young dogs on the flight the first time there's a little bit of little stress but not a big deal and then yeah you got seasoned veterans now they're you close the crate they look at you like hey can i get a couple of mimosas for the flight does that sound good um <laughs> but that's and, and the logistical aspect of the, i mean like you come here to alaska like the first time like you find a connection or two and now now you're like now you've made a, you got a whole family here to guess like an incredible community you're like linwood is got you put up at his place and and you know getting together your drop bags you got them you showed up here in january you know i'm assuming you got all your supplies here in alaska yeah, correct. for the yeah. drop bags yeah. so it's something very important you say sean i say 
when I was here the first time, I, I spent the summer here to just visiting people and travel around canals and I was interested in bloodlines and so on. So uh, I was here 30 days, I spent 25 nights in different canals and I was welcome to every place I went into. Because people were curious and want to know about Scandinavia and I'm maybe not like a really threat in that way, considering to, to racing and something like that. So, so it gave me so much of the people around here, the mushers and everything like that opened the doors for me and I, talking about dogs, talking about Sweden, Norway, Scandinavia, and so on. So so, so that's how I started to, to come around here. I think you have to be really humble to meet up people and friends first and then go to the idea that you want to do the race and so on. So it's been super important for me and super good for me to stay at Ray Reddington's place. I've been there last two years ago. I was staying there all the time before the race. I know Paul Gebbart very well before. Dean Osmar, a good friend of me, and, and Jeff, a good friend of me. I'm, I get to know Martin Booser, all these guys, you know, are traveling around. I spent two years at Mike Santos Canal in Campwell. I've been up the Fairbanks area. And all this make me to see the inside of the sport, which I like really much and also have passion for. Yeah, that's one thing, uh, you know, like you, you said you're doing this by yourself and and you are, but like the relationships that you've built uh, over the years of coming to Alaska almost make it a little bit easier to pull this off all, all by yourself. You know, like I I'm, I'm envisioning how the hell you pulled it off for your rookie run. You know, it's just like, uh, your first time doing the race is, is, uh, that in itself is a thing. And then, you know, doing it while you're traveling back and forth, I'm just, uh, your dedication to the sport and to the Iditarod itself is something that really is apparent to me, at least. Yeah, that, that's the key, and you're totally correct. I do it alone, but I do it also with friends here. So I have connections here, and I can call a friend and ask about a dog trailer or something like that that I need, or if do you have an extra dog house for me or whatever, you know, and I, I always get, get somebody to help me out. So absolutely, so it's like, not the one-man show in that way. So I have lots of good friends uh, over here in Alaska that I'm really thankful. I used to stay a couple of weeks at a place here at Limbo's Canal or last time in Reddington's Canal. I'm, I'm just so blessed to have that opportunity. And, and like, I mean, you're, you're talking about your travel issues. Like you were intending on, you know, taking four trips total or not you but a total of four people or four trips with four dogs and that gets you your 16 here right and then that didn't work out but again because of the relationships you had you're able to kind of like piece together the rest of of your team and uh that to me is is freaking you know like again it, it's a testament to you i think and in, in, in the the type of person that you are i mean uh you know i i don't feel like too many people want to just like hand over their dogs to someone that they may not know or that doesn't live near them or, you know, like, so you clearly have a reputation that speaks for itself, you know? And the mushing community too. Like, you know, Matt's Mats is coming out, coming down here, up here, over here, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and he's like, mushing community is like, what's up? dude you coming from sweden and he, they're like he's like yeah i come from sweden i got a bunch of dogs i want to run the iditor out they're like oh, that's awesome let's do it how can we help i got an extra dog trailer here's six <laughs> dog houses you need to use those we're not using them and next thing you know you know you make these things happen and and it's just like everybody wants everybody to be successful you know and and it's like that's what's it that's why that's why we're here that's why brennan and I are doing this thing. It's the people, the dogs, everybody together. It's a special, it's a special thing. Special no, thing. but it is. It is. I love it. And it absolutely is. I can, can tell you that. I've been in different sports and different attitudes also. So I know this machine world is a, a bit special, you know. that. But I also say that I'm inviting all these guys that have been here to my place also. To live with me and stay with me in Kiruna 
I have Reddingtons with me. All the families are staying home in Sweden. Brand says has been there. Ailey Circa, Alan Moore has been in my place. Dallas and Mitch has been in my place. You know, so they come over. We invite them to come over and see the area and traveling around and see different channels there in Norway and meet different cool, cool peoples and places and talk about dogs. And, and so, so it's a give, give thing that I really also want to give back to people that I can. I'm, I'm in Sweden, I'm in Norway, I can show you the places there to come around and just visit things like crash with my in my place a couple of nights and traveling around and so on. So which I, and that's, that door is always open because that door I got open from, from you guys in Alaska and over here. So that's super important for me to tell it. I'm, everybody who's wondering about coming over, just give a shot to me and I, I'll help you out. Brandon, you Andy, let's go to Sweden. Dude, I've literally like... <laughs> I'm I'm over here lost in this like idea of just like being there and uh yeah no uh I'm like man how how can how can our podcast somehow fund us getting to <laughs> all over the world and traveling in these amazing different kennels and seeing these amazing places all over the world <laughs> oh man that is uh yeah I, I just you know the it, it's like you're you're building like this uh, sense of uh, camaraderie within the mushing community that you're just your doors are open, um, and uh, it sounds like I, I don't I don't know it as well as Sean does, but it sounds like not all the mushers are like that, you know. And so I think that that is kind of uh, I don't know. I just think that it's kind of in. I love I love that you just have your doors open is kind of what I'm trying to say. And, um, you know. But I also think people have been also very interested in what we do in Scandinavia. Also, when I come over here, I always got the questions, you know, people asking, especially now, maybe more people are updated. But if I, I was already here 15 years ago and you know, starting to travel here and people really was interesting what happened in Scandinavia and so on and every bar you come to somebody tell oh, i have a related I have, my cousins here from sweden or norway or whatever you know vikings or whatever you know so it's always those things you know so i, I think it was always type of interesting also to know what we did over there and so it was yeah it was both sides i think so what is all right we're gonna shift a little bit so you have the whole Norwegian, Norwegian, Scandinavian, Swedish, Danish. Now we got Mila is Danish, I think. He uh, said, so, you know, very, very, there has been represented for many years, the Scandinavian region in the Iditarod. You've got like, they, the, I have only been around the scene. I believe I met you like my first winter in Denali. And I like, you know, I was just meeting everybody. So I was yeah. like, you know, this is like another, I, I didn't know anyone anywhere. So, you know, I, I was like, oh, okay, that's a nice, this seems like a nice guy. He's nice to talk to me. Okay, cool. He's staying here for a couple of nights. Cool. You know, and then, and then, and then you were gone. And now here we are talking. It's been like seven years. This is awesome. But, you know, you have like Robert Sorley who won the Iditarod. And there was that whole time where they had this team, this super team is my understanding from what I've been told, not through experience, that this super team was alternated between Sorley and someone else. I can't remember. And I'm just curious, like, you, like, do, were you following that when that was how, like 2004 or something? And, you know, and then you got, and then, and the, and the whole process from, you know, then and before then and on to Thomas Werner winning the 2020 race, you know, like, how, what's like the vibe up there with what's you know with with that whole scene and that whole process you know yeah i follow all the way up I, I follow with the team norway's a call with bjorn anderson chetil bakken and, and robert sorley i follow them of course what were the three of those sorely and, and who anderson it was uh, there were bjorn anderson and chetil bakken and then you, they always told it was one really like the planner of everything was Shetty Bakken and so on. And, and Robert was the one who was absolutely the best on the sled and so on. But they did lots of training together and and so on. So so absolutely, they were a top team. But they also changed a little bit in the way also people saw about kennels because they work more like with smaller kennels. We talk about 30, 40 dogs. 
back in the days, they thought like with the swingly times and by the day, I thought you need to have 200 dogs, you need to have a big kennel to win a Dieter and something like that. So they changed also a bit the way of seeing it, that you don't need a really super big kennel to win a Dieter. You need to just take care of every dog and individual really much and, and work with that instead. So I think that was one of the biggest changes, I think, because... And also nowadays it's much more expensive with dog food and people have lesser dogs. It's not like the big kennels as it, as it was before in, in the same way. And so on. And that was like four or five top names every year there for, for Alaska, for the editor, or maybe for 10, 15 years, you can say this popped out on the bits. But I absolutely follow everything like that and big inspiration. And my biggest inspiration is a guy called Sven Engholm, actually, back from, from Norway also. He won the Finnmark Lep at uh, 15 times, and he ran Aditor first year before. 15 times? And 15? Before, and so on. So he was my... That was the guy I started up with dogs with. To, to whoa, have, whoa, whoa. These dogs, yeah. Okay, this Finnmark, Finnmark Slope It is the 600-mile race, right? Yeah. He won it 15 times? He was top every year in the beginning of the years and so on. He, he was the, like the, the first guy. And then Robert more or less took, took over that. And and Robert is an amazing guy, really top athlete. He just won the fame and race home in Norway again, which is impressive of, I don't know, 60 plus years old and was super well trained and super good with the dogs. So Robert is still around and so on. So, so but I know there are lots of people asking me every year, they want to come over here and they want to come over and, and race here in Alaska also. I know that. So we have one very good musha from Sweden now, also Peter Carlson and and two or three very good from Norway. So really hope to take the chance to come over here and, and, and see this. Hmm. That is that is insane. The the 15. How long has that race been going on? Oh yeah. Eighties since the eighties, I guess. Yeah. I, I think eighty one. Okay. Wow. He literally won like forty percent of the races. That's crazy. All right. Okay. Cool. That's that's. Uh, uh, yeah. And that's the super team, the Norway Norwegian super team. I've heard about it, and, and you know, and I don't know a whole lot, but that's, that's that's cool what they had going on. They were winning. I mean, it sorely won for, in two thousand four. Was there another Norwegian team that won in that time, or a uh, Scandinavian 05. team? Oh five. Oh five. Who? Rob sorely won in oh five. Yeah. Or once. No, twice. just won. They won twice. Oh yeah, oh five, oh three, oh five, oh three, and then and then, but then like the other years that in, around then they were in the top five, you know, yeah. yeah, total force to be reckoned with. So, and then Mats, now he's coming in here, dude, feeling yeah. like what are you, what are you thinking, what are you thinking for this year, what are your goals? Yeah, you know, I have, have a good team this year, you know, but I also know lots of experience of being here on the race, so. I'm, I have been in a place around 20 plays, 16, 17 is my best, but we always, of course, look a little bit, bit in front to be to do better and so on. But uh, I must be really 100% honest, I, I never really put it all on the line to push the dogs and to be finished in that way. I, so it's been so important for me to do it in a really good way with with a good team and happy team. And everybody say it maybe, but I'm really that type of person also. So I'm, I'm not really the guy that really put it all on the line in the end of the race and so on. So, but yeah, so, so it's different when you work with dogs and animals. So it's been always my, my main priority and so on, but I, I'm, I'm proud of what we've done. We finished all the races the last 20 years. We hasn't a scratch, you know, so, so I think that's also a bit that we take care of the dogs in a good way and we doesn't uh, overrun them or run them too hard or, or, or rough and so on. So, but maybe, of course, with another musher, maybe you could get a better, better result in the list. I think because the dogs are good, but I, I'm, I'm pleased with what we're doing, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I, uh, you know, the consistency of you, of you being in this race and finishing, you know, middle, front of the middle of the pack or back of the front of the pack, whatever you want to call it. But you know, uh, it's and now we only got, you know, we got a few more, a few less mushers. You know, maybe you know, top twenty, top twenty is and certainly certainly in the cards for you and uh and you know who knows could be better and um so this year this last three days it has been brendan we were talking really about this. warm yeah. concerningly warm things are melting and it's okay for it to be this warm for two days, but it's, you know, it's now it's been like four or five days and, you know, they can run it on rivers. Rivers are, you know, 
they melt. They're water. They're water, dude. They melt. You know, so I'm interested to see, you know, what this, what the, what ends up happening here. Uh, you know, if they have to make any last minute changes or adjustments and, and, uh, you know, there's all these kind of whispers and murmurs I've heard the last couple of days, mostly from Buto, if we're going to be honest. Oh, yeah. He was saying, you know, that there's, uh, you know, a brown, brown, it's pretty brown there on the farewell burn is what I've heard from a few people. And, and, uh, Ooh, but then there's a lot. Can it be that? white? I've only seen it brown in my ears. I've never seen it white. <laughs> I, dude, <laughs> for me, it was like, like there was a couple of sections that were dusty, but like for the most part, it was actually like, yeah. it was pretty, like a pretty decent snow cover. I and, heard about that too. I heard about that too. So <laughs> I wasn't yeah. that. Yeah. I so I was like, oh, what is the big deal? Why does everyone talk about the farewell burn? Like it's just the whatever, you know. It it was fine for me, but I'm sure it can be 2014, right? You said 2014 was your was uh rookie yeah, year. Talk, that was your rookie year. And so uh, you know, people, Brendan, talk about the 2014 race. Is a special year. It's a special year. People, it, it lives down. You know, for me, I've heard of that year more times than any other year from people around the mushing scene. What was your experience? Rookie year, you're running with Buto, my our, you know, our good friend, and you know what? What you know? I I've, there no snow on the Dalzo Gorge Rainy Pass. You know, there no snow on the Farewell Burn. And they had like tree stumps that were, you know. A foot. Honestly, to be honest, to be honest, this was super crazy, and I still today can't understand how I didn't scratch, how I just keep on finish the race. I should have scratched earlier because there were so horrible conditions. And the last thing we got to told before we head out on a trial, we're gonna promise you a safe trail, and there was not anything but safe that year. You know, they have trees in the middle of, of the tray, like putting up and so on. It was like, yeah, I, I crashed three ribs myself. And I think about well, three or four times, I just dropped the sled down to the side to just stop, you know. I used to literally pull down the sled on the side just to make it stop, you know, because when I come over a hill, there was somebody laying there with dogs and so on. So it was totally crazy and, and um, not a good experience and so on but uh, and when i was on the trail i said i'll never do this again this was the worst i ever done in my life i've never been afraid mushing but that year i was afraid of mushing and of course when you see helicopter coming in and pick up people seeing jordan hurt and so on but the crazy thing with all this story is that the dogs was better than ever the dogs just dialed in the dogs was super good you know you can think you know, they didn't have snow and attractions and everything but they were so good and they were big teams coming into the coast and so it was the, the crazy thing it, it was our musher who had the biggest problems this year for sure and and we had and then that was super tough and it con was all the race you no know? it was not like any section was really calm to be honest it was just like next day was a new challenge the next day was a new challenge and um, i remember ralph johannesson who just won film rock slip but back in norway that year before he has come and asked me like can we run this together this is crazy and he had experience from 25 30 years but we were both rookies in editor that year but uh, so hey i'm also a rookie so better go talk to mitch cv or somebody all the older guys <laughs> that know it better you know but there were everybody was was afraid that year so you're correct 2014 was a special year and a small brain you have yourself when you then sign up for 2015 again. I don't. Remember. Would you just say a small brain? Is that what you <laughs> just said? Have, like, how, can I, how can I forget everything? How can I forget it? <laughs> oh man, that is amazing. Yeah, I can't imagine, man. It like you get these runs from hell, and you're just like, I just would love to get to the next checkpoint, and you're like, all right, it's behind me. It's probably fine. Like moving forward, it can't get any worse than that, and probably. I'm betting at some point it did, you know, it's just, that's just like how, how it went. It's gone for me and, and the, some of those runs for your, but like, yeah, 2014 sounds wild. Uh, and, and no, but this, this year total not, carnage. Yeah. You talked about this. Yeah, we've been warm now, you know, we are normally super good trials in my area where we go from Lim Limwood place in Willow and he is the one who's always groomed the trails here before and so on so but i was, went out yesterday and i just turned back you know because there were no really trail and the dogs was just floating down there so it was not good at all so and of course you're thinking of the, the, the days before the race you will have type of your schedule how you want to run them but you just have to change it and it's 
I guess the same for most of the guys who are in this area at least. So you just have to change them and uh, don't do any stupid moves to go out and train a long training with with horrible conditions. You know, it's something in the race. If you want to run in the race and do it, then you just go over it and do it. But here, when you can choose to not train the dogs in this condition, I choose to not train them. And they, they have the solid training for the rest of the year. So I don't think two or three more days so, or less, lesser training yes. will hurt. But I think it's more like a stress for people. You know, they really want to have this schedule that they have planned before the race. I think more of that. To be honest. Yeah, yeah. These last like few days, few weeks before the race, it's like, yeah, obviously you've done 99% of your training before today. And, but you still feel like, oh, I got to get my dogs moving. Like, what can we do? You probably try to get them some kind of exercise, like just running loose or going on a hike or something, or just like on a leash or something. And then we know we have just a day or two or three days more, and then it's going to drop down to colder temperatures. Hopefully the trails harden up. You can get out there to get your dogs out on some some longer runs. But yeah, it has been we had the coldest freaking two weeks ever, followed by the warmest two weeks ever. So Mats <clears throat> Mats, I'm wondering about how you're you handle or if you have any tips or stories in relation in regards to sleep deprivation. Yeah, seriously, I think it's super individual with the sleep deprivation. I, I have, I am really good to not sleep, you know. So I, I can handle the sleep deprivation super good, you know. So, so for me, I haven't always slept one time during my years, and I did the road something like that when I was on the race and so on. So I'm, I'm pretty much in my own zone when it's race time and and. Uh, preparing and stuff like that so i'm of course i'm super tired like everybody else it's not like i'm a super guy but i i don't have the same problem as i see somebody else have and on the trail that they have much more more issues with it so so i'm i, I am personally myself okay with not sleeping so much even if it's, it's tough but i'm very also concerned about drinking much and eating and lots on the trail and so on because i lose very much weight every year on the race i lose lots of weight but then super important to to keep on drinking good because otherwise i have some problems with migraine and stuff like that if you get stressed and you can't really if you have it on the race it's, it's not good at all you know so so taking care of yourself taking care of your body and so on and eat good and try to drink good when you can and stuff like that is of course the, the main main thing but i think this thing with sleeping and it's it's very individual so i, I can you know, i can only speak for myself it's like dude you need to be a a Diderot ricky coach yeah you know because yeah i mean brandon it sucks drinking water water doesn't even taste that good dude it's like you gotta get some like something to put in there but yeah it's tough to want to drink warm or cold probably cold water when it's cold and it's bland like I barely want to drink water like fully rested on a normal day, you know, like let alone being out there. I remember uh, uh, this is a fun story. So I uh on the last run, you know, you got Well, the, I said yeah, my water. I I uh you know, my rookie year I had it sprung on to me rather abruptly with a 5 days notice and you know, we have our drug test on the white white mountain you know, and I had been smoking weed, dude. That's the honest truth. And uh, and Alex Buto, he sent me a note that he left in the che the checkpoint at Elam. He's like, dude, you got to Here's what you do to pass your test. Just <laughs> he's like, just drink like two Nalgene's of water between here and there. You know, and and it'll get it out of your system or something or whatever. And uh, so I, and it was like the gnarliest storm I'd have been in the whole race up till then. It was blowing like 50. And I'm sitting, you know, the dogs, I'm like, I don't even see the trail. And I'm sitting there like just trying to chuck water. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's tough to stay hydrated out there. And uh, I'm glad you're taking care of yourself because I, you know, most people, most people aren't. Most people are running on nicotine and sugar. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, and actually, the other question, Sean kind of said, "Man, you should be you should be given the uh, tips for the rookies," and that's honestly what one of my next questions was. Um, you know, you, 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 it it takes a lot just to get you to the to the start line, right? 
and so it's pretty important for you it sounds like to make sure you're you're making the right decisions that in the big picture get you to the finish line uh and so i'm curious if you if you could simplify getting from start to finish like what are some tips you know if you're out there on the trail you know if someone happens to be listened to this before they go out for the rookie i did rod um you know like what are your tips for when you're dealing with like a mental breakdown or something yeah it's pretty uh, what you're saying there like just coming to the finish, like to the start line of a race, it's like you can have so much excuses to not come up to the start line of the race. You can find those excuses that I don't feel good, we, uh, everything like, doesn't work out and so on. But I've been super focused. If I tell something that we're going to do this, then we go and do this, you know. So then then I, I'm really focused to do it. Because as, as you say, it's really easy to say, like, just come to the start line, but just... I've been saying I'm going to do this race and then I do this race and focus on doing this race, which is very important for me to do. So, and then all the crew around me, everybody, we know this is the plan for this year. And then we, we first look over the race thoughts and so on. And then we make tours after that. And so that's the planning home for me. Like, so we start already in the summer back in and that, and I have supporting family and so on. I always, of course, ask if they're fine for me to go over and they tell me, this is what you want to do. This is a dream. And my, my wife and my daughters, everything like that, they support me super much. So, so, so that helps for the start. I mean, if if you if you say like that, so that helped me a lot. And then, considering the race is is like I'm very good to just uh, take checkpoint by checkpoint. Sounds super boring, sounds super, but that's how I do it. You know, that's this is the next stretch we're gonna do. This is a sixty-five miles. So how we're gonna do it the best way with my team, and how we're gonna split up the runs and everything like that. So it's always in the back of my mind and so on and look at the dogs and see what they need and so on because sitting home and make a paper drawing about how the race is going to be if you don't know it's going to be five day snowstorm in neural athlete or whatever going to happen on the race it's just like for me yeah you can have a, a base what you're going to do but when when it's really happening out there things have to change you know and so, your team is changing and so on so it, are they eating good? Are they happy? And uh, all of that, you know. So take all of these elements together and put in in a box, and then you work with that, and then work it in a, in a good way. My team is working on happiness very much, so I'm trying to stay happy with them. They see directly if I'm in a bad mood. They see directly, and there's total difference because during my life, I've been having time with them of my life that I haven't felt so good always, you know, and and so on. And when I go out in the dog yard, the dog see it on me that directly you know this is this is not a good day and so on and it's not we only say this is something we can see back as a mirror in the dogs if you're feeling good and the dog's feeling good and and so on so it's just go hand in hand with each other if you're stressed if i come home from a don't work they stress no way to go out training once you to train be stressed and be small irritated and so on then you skip the training but i learned that during the year i learned it by my mistakes and so on over the years so i think that's that's the standard if you have harmony on your life you're happy around what you're doing and this is what you want to do and then it helps you a lot on the trails nice sean what's going through your head over there i dude my head has nothing going on in my head ever i'm completely <laughs> foggy all the time oh, yeah. hard working day today <laughs> yeah i had a long day today um but yeah, you're gonna have some long days ahead of you. So, and I'll see you out on the trail. I'm excited about that. You know, it's fun. It's fun making, getting to talk talk with everybody before the race, and and hopefully you, I see you out. Will you be on the trail? Will you be? Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 helping out with the Iditarod Insider Crew, and uh, running a live feed. And I don't really know what it all entails. I'm still kind of. I must say I've been listening to your pod. Very good work. I, I told you we talked before even the, the the start and so on. So I think it's really good that. And listen to to what you do, and you do good work, and you just try to put passion in it in different ways and different aspects of different people, and not only like the the big guys, which is I think it's super important to also have some upcoming guys, some some guys that maybe not on the top of the list always, and so on. So I think it's very good that you are very wide in in the in the way you take interview with people and talk with people. It can't not always be like only only a couple of Brent and Dallas show every year, right? It's important that everybody gets, I mean, 
that their own opinion, what they think and what they do. But of course, it's a race. I, I understand the winner is important and somebody's also like to, to grow the sport is important to to have that. But I think what, what thing what I want to say about what I think really Alaska is one way behind the Scandinavia is like what I talk recreational classes, like having smaller classes with dogs, six, eight dog teams and so on like that to because if you have smaller teams, more people can actually do racing and so on. So then you you grow up, you don't need to, because it's expensive now, nowadays with, with, the, with the meat and everything around to have dogs. But in Scandinavia, maybe you've seen, we have lots of these eight, eight dog classes also. Then you only need nine, ten dogs and you can be a part of a race, a big race like Finnmark Lip or Family Lip or what we have. So... So that's you can do the 600 mile race with the eight dogs. There's an eight dog class. Miles race is just slightly shorter. Some some are slightly shorter and so on, and some are longer. So it's different. But I mean, anyway, you're there. Even if you can't be the guy who have 16 dogs on the race and have 30 dogs home, you anyway be part of the race and be part of one class in the race and so on. So that mm-hmm. would all happen. That editor could have that for sure. Also, I mean, there's absolutely that couldn't i mean maybe we could have like 20 30 mushers that did like a eight or class shorter run maybe they go all the way to yeah i don't know so but the, to to ruby or something like that for example they could also be like an i don't know logistic is not easy i know but it's also something that can grow the sport yeah yeah absolutely there's a lot lots of room for i mean it's con- this mushing world you know there's there's gonna always be races and coming and going and and it'd be good to, uh, but that's something that we really haven't seen up here is having those smaller dog class races and even, you know, started at a hundred mile race or something, you know, it would be cool to have a six dog, hundred mile race. That sounds awesome. Uh, I like that idea. I like yeah, that idea a lot. Much, many mushrooms around there who want to do races, you know, but maybe just editor is too expensive, too big project and others, but I was the other weekend i was at sheep creek and so like 20 teams set off from the from a sheep creek fun race 80 mile really cool and lots of happy people around there there was also it's just a fun race you know but that those things are so important uh, to put up i think yeah yeah absolutely getting getting the people everybody involved from on all levels you know um yeah there's that was what we saw was this weekend, this last weekend, the Two Rivers 200 and Two Rivers 100, you just saw like all these teams that I, I mean, I at least have never heard of, and and they put the race together with like zero heads up. Like I think they had that race figured out like three weeks before it happened, and there was like 25 teams in the race. So there's just like there is all these like recreational teams up in Fairbanks in the Fairbanks area. And they're just super stoked to go out there and run a hundred or two hundred mile event, and be around a bunch of other dog teams, a bunch of other not like minded people. So that was kind of cool to see. And it's like I'm at, you know, that was just like stringing together something last minute, making it an Iditarod qualifier. Next thing you know, you got all these teams, all these mushers coming into the scene. And that's that's you know, I think the ongoing, like this is what everyone always who doesn't really. People that are peripherally involved with the mushing community would say, oh, there's only 40 people in the Iditarod this year. Oh, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really getting. No, have you, you haven't been around all the other races. The Kinnick 200 completely filled up. The Cusco back up to the numbers it was five years ago. Copper Basin, 25, 30 mushers. The Two Rivers 200 gets put on last second, has 18 participants. Yeah. They're seeing, they're seeing the seeing uh, the stoke and the activity in these races. And maybe, okay, maybe not everybody's ready to run a thousand mile event across the entire state of Alaska, but maybe they could be. No, and, but it's super good that you yeah. tell it because it's not only about I did the, the big race, it's so much about the other races also, which is really, really important. And see, it's been fully, fully booked all of those races. You know, this is great. This is super good. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think for some, you know, the Iditarod is super important. It is seems to be kind of the iconic event in the mushing world. But, you know, I wish that there was a little, people knew a little bit more about the Cusco. People knew a little bit more about the Quest. People knew a little bit more, you know, about these other events that are, are so awesome, special, and uh, really difficult. And, you know, when I, 
was mushing before I ran the Iditarod. They're like, hey, you know, these visitors to Alaska, they'd be like, so you're going to run the Iditarod? I'm like, I mean, I don't know. But like, I ran a copper basin. It was freaking hard. And it's like, you never heard of it, I guess. But like, you know, yeah. can I get like anything? Like, give me a little <laughs> credit? Like, it was kind of, you know, some people might say like the 300 mile races in some ways because you're just like not sleeping at all the whole time. You know, you might sleep a little bit here and there, but like, you know, at least you, you're getting some naps in most people in the Iditarod. Unless you know, you're so Mots. Oh, yeah. Mots, Mots yeah. doesn't sleep, dude. He's a I'm beast. Sleeping also. I'm sleeping also, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, uh, you know, we're I think we've been going now for about an hour and uh, want to be respectful of your time. Always. Um, one thing that I was just kind of thinking about in my head. Uh, do you have like a favorite year that you've you've run the Iditarod? Like whether it was the result you were happy with, the adversity you fought through, you had to, you know, to get there. Or maybe it was like, man, these conditions were the best conditions this year. Um, I'm just kind of curious your thought on that. Yeah, you know, I, I run the race, but it's been like you say, like the race is never the same every year, you know, which is not around 14 crazy a year, 15 move the start to Fairbanks, 16 change the route, 17 again Fairbanks, 18. So it's been really different type of of years I've been running, but I enjoy very much to be to George Atlas home place. I can say that I think it was really emotional going into a place called Huslia one year. We run, they changed the route there. We come in from, from Galena, run to Huslia and, and Koyokok and those areas. And, and it was a special atmosphere there. It just passed away. We passed that village that year and everything around what happened. So that trail that year, I liked really much, to be honest. I think it was super cool to pass there and so on. And also have some amazing stories on the trail what happens on the trail and stuff like that and we help people and get helped by people and so on during during all my years i've been running so so i, I remember i can get understand when i'm sitting here in a room with limbo fielder who done it 20 plus times and you have spent pan spirit award on left side his second place on the right side and just sitting and have a chat with him and talking about what happened back in the days and and so on. So I think it's so much things going on in a race like this that you have always with you, you know, in, in some good ways, some bad ways. But it's a memory for your life to to be part of this long journey and race and meeting the people, the locals and so on around the race. And I, I must say I've been really thankful that uh, also for the race community that uh, the small places we pass through is the open there place for us also for mushers every year and and celebrate this this thing to do the race and and so it's been it's been uh, many memories during the years and i hope we can have some more in front of us also it's not like a getting super old but i also feel like uh, i'm very really humbled to be here every year i'm here i'm not cannot know really when if there will be a next time or something like that but i'm very humbled to to finish this race seven time and now go go out to my eight time journey to do it so yeah, something special about those small communities off the road system in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. You know, you just you don't get that kind of vibe in many other places on earth, really. So, and uh, yeah, George Atla, Brendan, do you know who George Atla is? I, I'm not going to pretend to. That's okay. I'm not going to pretend to. All right. So, yeah, yeah uh, George Atla, he's maybe Mots, you might be better at explaining it. Why don't you go ahead? No, I'm, I'm not better than anybody else to explain it, but he's a legend in the mushing world. You know, he's done a lot for, for, for the mushing world. He's amazing. He was an amazing musher, and he was before his time when he considered the dogs and everything like that uh, and so on. So so it's worth to read some of his stories and books or whatever is out there because it's pretty pretty epic epic stuff and from, from where he was and the village and the area around. So so, so that. But it, it's much it much uh, big names during the years, like... Uh, Post the Reddington's family, everything like that. Also, so I'm super pleased to be be part of the Reddington's when I'm here and, and meeting them and and be part of their families and so on. So I have big respect in all these families that put in so much in this sport that we're doing today, and that's why that's why it's running. That's why the race is running. So, 
I was just looking at some pictures of him. Yeah, he's got aviators and he's got a bad leg and he won the Ferrandi a bunch of times. Also known as the Hus Huslia Hustler or something. Huslia Huslia Hustler. Huslia Hustler. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> nice. Well, Mats, thank you so much for your time. I know you've super busy time, literally friggin' less than two weeks from the big race. And uh I'm I'm gonna be rooting for you out there for sure. And hopefully see you too. Um, and and has anyone ever told you you look like Ernie Els? You know who Ernie Els is? Ernie Els. No, 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 nobody told me. But I also want to say <laughs> you must you must say Mr. Buto. It's time to he, be on the front of the team. It's always the back sweeps in the race, you know, with the snow machine. I never get to meet him. So say hi to him if you meet him. Okay. All right. He's listening, trust me. So uh, yeah, that'll be good enough. Yes. So and thanks for putting up the good, good uh, pod guys and shows. I appreciate that. So, and, and yes, thank you. Thanks for coming on.